Paul's son, uh, certainly as a big Saul Bellow fan, uh, sort of a full circle. And we published this collection of uh, 51 stories. Uh, the Night Archer is different than probably any other collection of short stories you'll, you ever find. I'm a big uh, consumer of short stories, so I know of, of what I'm talking about here. Most collections of short stories are around a single theme. It could be set in a, a small southern town or a small New England town, or it could be about soldiers at war. Uh, each one of these stories is completely different. Um, the style is different, the genre is different, the perspective is different. Uh, it contains ghost stories, uh, mystery and murder stories, detective stories, uh, war stories, historical stories, um, love stories. And since I'm speaking in a, in a synagogue tonight, a lot of stories about God and faith, because I've been involved with faith all my life. And um, it's rather controversial in Israel. You should know that Israeli politicians, politicians cannot talk about faith. Uh, American politicians have to talk about faith, even if they don't have faith. But here, if you, even if you have faith, you can't talk about it. It's a, it's a cultural quirk. Uh, but in my short stories, I can write about them. Um, the short stories as a form is one that, that has fascinated me. It's, it's the ultimate discipline for a, a fiction writer because the, the, the author of short story has to be able to do in three pages what a novelist does in 300 pages. You have to put together a plot. You have to develop characters. You have to have drama. Uh, you have to have dialogue. All in three or less pages. Some of these stories in this collection are one and a half, two pages. And so I always refer to it as the haiku of, of fiction writing. Uh, tremendous discipline. And if you, you read the book, there's an introduction where I talk about why writing generally, certainly fiction writing generally, and why uh, writing short stories in particular is, uh, is very Jewish. That's very Jewish. You know, um, I live in Israel. We have archaeological digs all the time. We're digging up things from 2,000, 3,000 years ago. But no archaeologist has found sort of a unique uh, Jewish architectural form. All of our architecture we dig up is derivative. It's Babylonian. It's Roman. It's Greek. Um, and there probably was a, a Jewish musical tradition because the Bible makes many mentions of music and musical instruments, but we don't know what they sounded like. We don't know what an ancient song really sounded like. So we don't really have a, a, an artistic tradition in that way, not a plastic art traditions. We don't have a, a musical tradition. What we do have, what we do have in an amazing abundance is a literary tradition. Uh, the Bible is a magnificent work of literature. And not only is it literature, it's short stories. It's a collection of short stories. It's some of the greatest short stories ever written. Uh, recently on, on Yom Kippur, we, we read the story of Jonah. Uh, by the way, it takes place right here in downtown Jaffa. And, uh, and it's, it's all of a page and a half long, but you could discuss the book of, jo of Jonah for, for days. I see it as a, as a political and, and diplomatic primer, believe it or not. Uh, I hear it's a, it's a disquisition on the nature of leadership. Um, but you view it many, many different ways in a page and a half. Um, the language is, is extremely economic. It is uh, is pithy. It's, it's, it, it has every turn of drama in it. it. It's wonderful literature and it's ours. And it's a specific type of, of Jewish writing. And the Jewish writing goes to the, to the essence of the Jewish experience through history and the Jewish concept of freedom. I've talked about you know, writing short stories is being liberating for me. I, I can be anybody, anywhere, uh, anytime I want to be. But it takes place in the framework of a, of, of a short story, which involves tremendous amount uh, of discipline, tremendous amount of discipline all the time. Every word has to be judged and weighed. Is it, is it extraneous? Do I need this word? And that itself is very Jewish. We have, um, in Hebrew, we have many words for freedom. Um, those who know Hebrew, it could be chofish, cherut, dror, atzmot, many words for freedom. We, to my knowledge, the only people on earth that has a holiday that is dedicated to freedom, that celebrates freedom, Pesach, Passover. Uh, and yet it is that holiday that comes with uh, additional restrictions. Amazing. And this is sort of the, the, the nature of Jewish freedom. It's different than the freedom we knew about or wanted in, 50, in the 60s and the 70s. That was freedom where everything goes. Uh, Jewish freedom is not where everything goes. Um, you, you can get out of Egypt, but right after that, you're going to be at Sinai. And you're going to get a book that tells you how your freedom will be restricted in many ways, because that is the only way to guarantee freedom within the framework of, of law and discipline. Um, and that becomes, I believe, one of the Jewish people's greatest gifts to civilization. It's hardwired 
uh, into the, the US Constitution uh, and checks and balances. And, um, and it, it, I think it, it deeply informs Jewish writing because we gain freedom, but we also take on uh, tremendous restrictions in that writing. And that's what these stories are about. Um, again, 51 stories, each one's different, but they draw on my experiences, whether it be in, in politics and in battle, uh, in the classroom, uh, in life as a father, as a grandfather, as a husband, uh, as a son, uh, certainly a lot of relationships, stories uh, from basically every relationship there is. And, uh, and each story comes from a certain place. Sometimes it comes um, from multiple places. Um, and just give you, uh, let's say, I think of one example of a story is a story called D at the beginning of this uh, of collection uh, about a father of a, um, of a handicapped child, a child who is uh, probably semi-autistic. Um, and I had children who had all sorts of difficulties and all sorts of challenges. So I understand what this father was dealing with. Um, another story would be about uh, experience in Washington, a great funny story called Good Table uh, about social climbers in Washington. And these people really exist that their whole life is to climb table, to climb uh, the social ladder, because in Washington, they say to get good table, you have to get good table. You have to host the right people in order to get invited to the right parties. And of course, the the, uh, the Mount Everest of this expedition is uh, is the White House, to get invited to the White House. It's about one such couple. Um, stories about Hollywood, um, stories about Israel, stories about the Holocaust, um, deeply impacted by the Holocaust. So that's the Night Archer. I've been, um, I've been very, very pleased with the reactions to this book. The, uh, the criticisms, the critiques, the reviews have been overwhelmingly uh, positive. People are a little bit shocked, I think, about some of the things I write about. Um, uh, we're writing, I'm writing during a period where writers, particularly writers such as myself, um, are expected to write about less and less in terms of subject matter. Um, and I am, I see this book as very much a, a cry of freedom. I'm gonna write about whatever I wanna write about. No one's gonna tell me otherwise. You know, if they wanna condemn me, they're gonna condemn me, but I'm gonna write about it because that's my freedom. So I, I hope you enjoy these books, these stories as much as I enjoyed writing them. Um, and if you have any questions about them, I'd be very, very happy to answer. So I'll remind everyone, you can chat me your questions. Um, of course, I have a few prepared ones. Um, I'm a concrete learner. Why, and the Night Archer is the last story. <clears throat> Full transparency, I went to that and read it. Um, why did you call the whole collection the Night Archer? Because you, you, you first of all, you need a title. <laughs> and uh, my original work title, I, I should know that almost all my books went through title changes. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a book uh, called Power, Faith, and Fantasy uh, about the history of America and the Middle East. And the original title was Fantasy, Faith, and Power. My, my publisher said that no man would ever buy a book that began with the word fantasy. You had to start with the word power, believe it or not. Uh, so books go through title changes. The original title of this book uh, was a, a line that my mother, who was a, a family therapist, um, used to say that the presenting problem is not the problem. But it was a little bit too clunky. And so we had to choose the name from one of the stories. The story that the, the, the title that worked the best was The Night Archer. It is the last story in the collection. It is a very short story, it's one page. And um, it's a story that has a very deep meaning to me because um, I was a lifelong insomniac. Um, I, didn't, I didn't sleep as a kid. And you know, I'm a little ADHD as you can imagine. And it's hard for me to shut off. I used to think that I didn't have an off button at night. And uh, and several years ago, for reasons that are completely mysterious to me, uh, as I closed my eyes at night, I began to picture an archer. And this archer was not just any archer. He was an archer uh, in 15th century English army taking part in the Battle of Agincourt in 1415 against the French knights. And of course, this comes from my historical background, but um, he was watching this archer and having him pull back uh, a British longbow, an English longbow, a very powerful bow. I, I had been an, an archer myself for many years. And, uh, and watching this arrow climb into the sky and, and shorten as it climbed, of course, that for some reason brought on sleep. And I was very, I was very grateful to this archer. I don't know his name. And so I, I wrote a story about him. And so it's the night archer. And the night archer is it's dreamy. And these stories come out of a, uh, of a certain dream world. 
I just want to share my screen for one minute because I, I do think, um, and obviously you had people work on this, but it's just a beautiful picture. It's just a beautiful picture and, you know, the big bow and, um, and, th and that's the book you're looking for, everybody, if you haven't already um, read it. <clears throat> It was my wife's decision to call it the Ninth Archer, and it was my wife's idea to give it that cover. And uh, we described the cover artist uh, in in, uh, in the United States, and, and they produced it exactly the way we we uh, we, we we talked about it. It was amazing. Um, we wanted that sort of dreamy quality to it, and I'm delighted with the cover. Yeah, um, you just said something about writers have to writing less and less. Can you tell us more what you meant by that? That statement intrigues me. Well, you know, you're in the United States and the issue of cultural appropriation and uh, say straight people writing about gay people or non-white people, uh, white people writing about uh, non-white people, uh, all that has an impact. Uh, um, Ambassador Oren, I don't see him anymore. Right. <laughs> Okie doke. Um, let me see if, you know, hopefully he'll realize that he's not on and come back in. Um, and if anyone has, oh, here he is. I hope that was him. Back. Okay, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Uh, that happens. You know, what happens in Israel, so many people are using the internet at night because they're locked down, that you sometimes get interference. My apologies. Um, I said before that, you know, in America, it's become controversial that um, if you are a certain sexual orientation, you can't write about a different sexual orientation. If you're a certain color of race, you can't write about a different race. Um, and there's actually been, you know, really serious controver controversy about this. You know, I, I'm writing from afar, but in this book, I'm going to write about straight people and gay people. I'm going to write about white people and non-white people. Um, and um, I feel that that is my freedom as, as a writer. That is that is what writing is about. It's about it's about imagination, um, and I, I get the feeling sometimes that there's a an attempt to stymie and and crimp imagination, and I think that it's time we fought back. Um, we just had a speaker a couple of weeks ago on the cancel culture, which takes a little bit of what you just said, and you know how do we manage? Um, and was talking about different journalists and. Um, especially Barry Weiss, who left the New York Times. So um, we certainly can appreciate everything that you're saying. Um, did you want to take any of these stories and make them a book? No, but it's always a question. And I, I'm actually writing a novel now that I thought might be a short story, and it turned out it was a novel. Um, I have a novel coming out in April. Um, it's called "All Who Call To All Who Call in Truth. Uh, much of it takes place in a synagogue in the 1970s and the synagogue in which I grew up on it had the quote from uh, the Bible on the wall called, you know, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Uh, and it's the name of the novel, to all who call in truth. So I think um, novels present themselves as novels. Um, stories present themselves as stories, even poetry present those stories. I must be very honest with you. I don't choose these things, they choose me. Yeah, I, I well, we I find that very fascinating, and um, in how you would the creative effort in in doing all of that. Um, and you talked about that this is a Jewish book because of the freedom. Can you talk a little bit more about that? You also mentioned um, our constitution, and um, for those of us other people on the line, I know you know this. Um, Israel does not have a constitution. It has a declaration. Can you talk a little bit more about freedom, no constitution in Israel? Uh, wrap uh, it up in a short no, story. Listen, I, you know, it, it was, um, it was uh, Herzl who said famously, if you will it, it is no dream. You know that. If you will it, it is no dream. But I think that there's a, there's a, there's a corollary to that. Uh, by the great uh, Anglo-Irish poet Yeats. And Yeats said, in dreams begin responsibilities. And so you, you can realize a dream, but with that dream comes responsibilities. And there are responsibilities in writing too. You can be responsible to your text, you can be responsible to your characters. Um, one 
principle that I strongly adhere to is that if I create a character, I have to develop that character. It creates a I, I have a responsibility as a creator to give that character, even if they have just a walk on, a passing, uh, a, a passing appearance in, in any in any book, in any short story. I have to give them the fullest possible um, treatment. That's what's. That's one of the the wonderful uh, aspects of uh, Charles Dickens writing, that if you just get a character who's, who's on, you know, for, for two lines, Dickens will devote time uh, to developing that character as much as possible. It's what attracts me to Israel, frankly. Um, you know, Israel, as flawed as any country in the world with terrible problems, and right now, you know, political upheaval. And in Jaffa, where I'm talking to you right now, every night there are huge demonstrations about the government, people asking, you know, demanding the resignation of the prime minister. Um, what I love about it is that uh, that Israel is the only place on earth where Jews can take responsibility for themselves as Jews, and we take responsibility for everything. We take responsibility for our, you know, our sewer system, our, our electricity, uh, our internet, uh, our defense, our foreign policy, um, and I love that sense of responsibility. And it's a response, sense of responsibility I feel in writing as well. Um, those of you who are parents, you know what that responsibility feels like. Very similar. Um, uh, I've been involved in the constitutional issue in, in Israel for ooh, uh, well over 20 years, and uh, I take a controversial position. Imagine that, me, a controversial position. Uh, I'm against the Constitution for Israel. As much as I admire and love the Constitution for the United States, and, uh, and I've read it, and I, I, I would refer to it often in my political uh, speeches, um, a Constitution is not appropriate for every society, and certainly not for this society, uh, which is deeply uh, divided racially, um, religiously, culturally, not just politically. And this country um, survives because it is not locked in to a constitutional system. I'll just give you one small shocking example. Um, you would be hard pressed to who will not um, press panel down to the flag of the United States of America. Even someone who is you know, very radical is going to get up and, and show respect to the flag and, and sing the Star Spindle Banner. In, in, in Israel, we have over 20% of our members of Knesset who will not salute the flag, who will not sing Hatikva. Uh, they could be Arabs, they could be Haredim, ultra-Orthodox, uh, they could be communists, um, and they don't. And if you have a constitution that says you have to show the flag in front of every school, um, there'll be a revolt here. Um, this country survives because of areas of gray, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of flexibility here. Look what's happening with Corona, where you know, the question is whether a secular school should be closed, but ultra-Orthodox religious schools should remain open because for the ultra-Orthodox, uh, there's nothing, the, the notion of education is not just, it's not just important, it's holy to them. So how do we address that issue? How do we address that disparity? If you have a constitution, it's much, much more difficult, uh, much more difficult. So I, I, that's why I have not been a, a, a constitutionalist in this country, even though in the United States, I'm very much a constitutionalist. Um, uh, I want to say to my viewers, on Prime, there's a, a fantastic, there's a Broadway play. You can get it if you have Amazon Prime, what the constitution means to me. And at the end, they have a discussion on abolish or keep the constitution. So. Um, following what Ambassador Oren said, I think that there's, you know, different arguments even here in the United States on both sides. And so it's very interesting to hear your insight and with what's going on in Israel <clears throat> and the United States, for goodness sakes. Um, you know, we have an election coming up. Hopefully we're not going to have as many as elections as you did. Um, <laughs> right. Um, and uh, yeah. <clears throat> Um, your, I saw a little bit of your interview with, on a radio show with a, a man named Mex Passes, and that's the name of one of your stories. Yes. So, <laughs> coincidentally. Coincidentally. So, and um, the dialect, which you must have researched. Um, so I want to hear about your research. Now, you said to him that was your favorite story. Is it really your favorite story and why? It's up there with the top three. And um, it, why, first of all, I, I love history and I love using historical tools. So this story takes place on the American frontier in 1841. And it takes place in a, in a sort of a, a remote, miserable army camp uh, with a miserable commander um, who is faced with, for want of a better word, he's faced with a monster. 
And um, so first of all, in order to get the language right uh, of what American English sounded like in 1841, and then to get the, the format of a military dispatch from 1841, I went back and I read. I read, I don't know, dozens and dozens of dispatches from the US military in 1841. And I think I got it right. Um, not easy, by the way, talk about discipline. Because they use language in different ways, beautiful ways. Uh, that's not what the story's about. Um, the story is about the, the multiple facets of human nature, particularly uh, that part of us is uh, human and part of us can be very inhuman. And that is a, a major theme in literature from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, and onward. The, the Greeks were fascinated by it. You know, the senators and the minotaurs, um, the, the, the sardars and the, and the pans uh, were half animal, half man. Uh, that's what Metaxas refers to. It's, a, it's taken from the symposium by Plato. And the, um, the commander of this fort, in dealing with this monster who may be part man, uh, is referring back to his own uh, classical education uh, and reading the symposium. So it's, it's a complex story. It's not an easy story, I realize. But I wanted people to read it. You know, the placement of the stories in the collections is always, is always a challenge. Uh, what stories go up front? What stories go up back? Um, and I wanted Metaxas to be up front but even though uh, people may get discouraged reading it because it is a it's a challenging story and uh, pardon me mm -hmm. agreed I mean you I had to read it twice it's Good. short read it twice but uh, you get you get caught up in the dialect uh, go ahead please so um, one of my favorite stories I've left to, the, to be the penultimate story there's a story that is just before the night archer it's called the Betsy Bob and it's a, it's a Jewish story. And it's a story about uh, four uh, Jewish women uh, who as uh, young girls attended the same sort of uh, upscale uh, summer camp in Maine. And in this summer camp, uh, they had an experience which changed their lives, each one in a different way. And now um, about 40 years old, uh, each for different reasons, is coming back to recapture that experience. And it's about their journey back to transformation. Um, you told us before that the inspirations behind the book come from different, you know, um, life experiences. Have you had any, um, how can I say, you know, blowback as someone called and said, hey, you know, why did you tell that story or, you know, <clears throat> is anyone identifiable in here? Was anyone mad? Was anyone happy? <laughs> no, no, not yet. I've, got, I've gotten away with that pretty well. Um, many people have said that in the, uh, I don't know if it's the second or third story called Liberation, uh, that the character reminds me a lot of Ellie Wiesel. Now, Ellie was a, a dear friend of mine um, and a dear, dear friend of my wife's. And um, it, the character is not based at least solely, solely on Elie Wiesel. He's, he obviously has an influence on the character, but it's based on many Holocaust survivors I've known and, and the price of not only being a survivor, but also being someone who's, uh, who's famous, the price of fame. And so it has a much more uh, universal appear, uh, appeal or at least sort of subject matter, um, though people tend to identify the, the main character with Ellie. Yeah. And you said you had um, a couple of favorites. Tell us about your other favorites. I mean, I know they're all probably like children, but they're all like, don't tell the other stories that you pick them up. Well, it's funny that my three three stories that I like the best tend to be the longer stories. Um, so I mentioned I mentioned Metaxas, I mentioned the, the Betsy Bob, um, but there's another story, a very complicated story again called the Thirty Year Rule, and um, the Thirty Year Rule itself is is a double entendre. Um, the story is about uh, British rule, which lasted thirty years over an imaginary island in the Indian Ocean. And uh, that's about, it's about the 30 year rule of Britain over this imaginary island. But it's also refers to a law. It's a law that exists in the United States, in Great Britain and Israel. The 30 year rule says that after 30 years, uh, democratic governments will release uh, formally classified secret diplomatic correspondence to researchers. Um, those of you who might have read my book about the Six Day War, uh, I used the 30 year rule uh, to begin researching that book in, 19, in 1997, 1998, to give you an example. So I was the first one to read those documents. And this is a story about 
um, a former British diplomat, um, a, a, a gay man who had a lover on this island, who uh, goes back to the British archives. The British archives are located in Kew, uh, outside of London. And he's no longer living in Britain. He lives in San Francisco, but he's gone back to look at the correspondence from 30 years before about what transpired on this island and how this island came to disaster. And his whole life was, was, was profoundly impacted by this. The theme of the story is different. The theme of the story is about truth. It's about what does it mean to write down, for example, a, a, a diplomatic memorandum or a memoir or a book? How much truth is really being told and the way we remember truth? So this is, a, again, it's a classical theme set into a, a complicated story. By the way, it's a comedy. Unlike Metaxas, unlike Betsy Bob, this is a funny story. I laugh my way through it. And it's, it's very dear to me. It's an idea I've had in my head, I'd say, for 20 years at least. Um, you talked about, you know, you got access to these papers, you were a diplomat. Um, how do you reconcile your fiction writing with your diplomacy? Well, it's more like a, how do I recognize my, my fiction writing with my history writing? Uh, cause the greatest compliment I ever get as a historian was to say, people say, oh, your book reads like a novel. Uh, that's great. And, uh, and it's like a six days of war, uh, the six day war is one of the great dramas of history. And you could you could write it almost like a novel. Um, the um, on the other hand, being a historian, as you've heard, it impacts my writing. I can I have a story that's set in 1538 about a conquistador going to the New World and being very shocked about what he finds in the New World. And uh, it turns out that he's from the old world. This is the New World is very much the New World. Um, there's this a story about um, B-17 pilots in World War II. Uh, there are Holocaust stories. Um, so history is a very important tool for me as a, as a writer. As a diplomat, um, writing is, is very important because to write, you have to, I think, understand human nature. And I think to be a diplomat, you have to understand human nature. Diplomacy, 92% of it is personal relationships, really. Uh, you may have heard that before, but I'm telling you as someone who's been there, it's personal relationships. And those relationships are informed by sensitivity, uh, by ability, strangely enough, to listen. More important than talking as an ambassador is listening as an ambassador. And, and understanding, understanding the human condition. It's, a, it's an immense tool, probably the most important tool that diplomats have. Um, did this book come out in Hebrew? It, not yet. All my other books have been translated. Um, this book, not yet. It's going to be a challenge, isn't it? Imagine thinking about it in Hebrew. How do, you, how do you explain some of these things in Hebrew? Right. <laughs> Right. You said, you know, that there's a lot of words in Hebrew for freedom, but there's a lot less words in Hebrew, you know, Biglal. And so and so you don't you don't translate it. You have a translator with a translator. Yeah. Yeah. Because I have to, get, have to get the nuance. You have to get the sense. Now, I think this this book will be translated to be easier than my novel that's coming out in April, because the novel is about um, a junior high school football coach. And go translate, you know, hash mark, scrimmage line, extra point, you know, to, to Hebrew. These, these terms just simply exist. Yeah, just football, that means soccer. Yeah, you're, you're going to have, you got a lot on your hands for that. Right. Um, do you go through the galleys, though, in Hebrew? And, you know, I think, um, you know, I've heard you speak a little bit in Hebrew. Obviously, you're, you know, totally fluent, but, you know, listening and reading um you know those those language receptors are very different so very different. you know I, i've actually talked to diplomats who prefer negotiating in hebrew they, they can speak perfect english but they want to speak through a translator because hebrew because it has so few ver uh, words in it it's about you know three to five thousand words in a used vocabulary as opposed to english which has 20 25 thousand uh used words hebrew is very precise and it doesn't leave a lot of room for misunderstandings. Uh, so I, I've known Israeli statesmen who prefer actually speaking in Hebrew than speaking to English. Um, you know, clearly, in order to be uh, an Israeli politician, to get up in Knesset and speak extemporaneously in front of a hall where everyone is screaming at you, you gotta be. You have to have a high level of Hebrew to be on Israeli television, as I often am on Israeli radio, which I am pretty much every day. You have to have a high level of Hebrew. But um, one of the great, I would say failures of my life is that I could not write fiction in Hebrew. 
and uh, what can I say? That the language of my soul is English, and uh, I don't think it's going to change. Um, I think that's evident in this book because um, having read, you know, different writers, you know, in Hebrew to English, and um, I think it was. I can't remember, but a translator also got um, a literature prize because they translated so beautifully. I mean, to translate is just a whole nother, I'm sorry, go ahead. It was the Man Booker Prize from David yeah. Grossman. Yes, yes, you are correct, sir. The um, translation is not, is not a vocation, it's an art. And the, 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 a great translator is also an artist. Do you have the same translators for all your books? Uh, no, I've had different translators from all my books. But again, um, translating history is a lot easier than translating fiction. Absolutely. What power, in power fiction and fantasy was hard because many of the quotes were in very old English, in 18th century English. Go get that sense in Hebrew uh, of a language that is, that is no longer used in day-to-day -day parlance. Well, I guess if you went with biblical or Aramaic, but... You know, that that's not my that's your translator problem. Um, uh, tell us more and um, more about some of the other um, your other favorites in the book or the the story you had the hardest time writing. Ooh, no one's ever asked me that question. You know that. Um, there are stories that are that are you know sort of deeply. Uh, are my favorites because they speak to me very deeply. Um, the story toward the end of the collection, um, uh, two stories that are very dear to me at the end of the collection. One is a comedy. It's called Rosen in Paradise. Now I'm a, 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 a I would say a pathological Philip Roth fan. I've read every Philip Roth novel at least once, probably more, at least twice. Um, I grew up in his area. Uh, my father was the director of Beth Israel Hospital in the Aquatic section of Newark, and that hospital appears in every single Philip Roth book. Uh, I know the streets. I even know some of the people who appear in Philip Roth books. And, um, and yet you could summarize, or I could summarize Philip Roth in, in one sentence, and that sentence is paradise lost. Uh, for Philip Roth, the paradise was Waquaic, Newark uh, of the late 1940s, early 1950s. And in all of his books, he's trying to get back to that most perfect period in history. Read about it. And so I asked myself, what would happen if a writer like Philip Roth, his name is Rosen, uh, were to die and, and go into the next world? And he would wake up and find himself in this neighborhood. And then the question would be, is this neighborhood heaven or is it hell? And if it's heaven, why? If it's hell, why? And that's the story of Rosen in Paradise. And I had a lot of fun writing it, really did. Um, a deeply held story is a story called um, The Hero's Widow. And it's an Israeli story. And Israeli readers will identify the stuff that the word Israel appears nowhere in it. And it's about a woman who had a husband. Um, and that husband was the commander of a base during a war and the base was overrun by the enemy. And according to some reports, uh, the husband died a, an immensely heroic death and becomes a national hero. There are poetry contests about him and, and plays about him. But other reports say that he had a less than heroic death. <laughs> Depends who you ask. But in any case, uh, this woman has to bear the memory of her hero some, uh, husband. And then she meets somebody. She meets a man who's a new immigrant to the country. Um, and this man has to deal with being the wife, being the husband of the widow of the hero. And so the entire story is a disquisition on, on the nature of heroism. And it's a subject that has long fascinated me. And uh, my father was a war hero uh, from World War II. I've grown up with heroism all my life. I'm surrounded with heroism here. Um, and, and the question is, what is heroism? Was the, the man who died in the war the real hero? Or was the man who married his widow uh, the real hero? And the story stems from an Israeli diplomat. I won't mention her name, a senior diplomat. Um, I was very uh, enamored of her. And in her office was a, a, a photograph of her first husband who had died in the Yom Kippur War. And she had remarried and, um, and loved her husband very much. But I used to always ask myself, what it would it be like to be that husband with this photograph hanging in the room? 
and uh, it, it was an interesting question, I think. And so that that was a that was a deeply held uh, story. Stories that were that more difficult, more complex. We mentioned in Metaxas, which was a very difficult story. Um, I have several stories that are triptychs. That is like three stories put together. And I'll, I'll tell you one story that was, I think, the most difficult for me. Um, and in my last diplomatic job, I was the, the deputy um, in the prime minister office in charge of diplomacy. And in that position, I made uh, numerous um, uh, diplomatic state visits abroad. And during this period, Israel developed a close relationship with Lithuania. And we hosted the Lithuanian uh, prime minister and foreign minister here. And I was invited to reciprocate and go to Lithuania. Now, Lithuania and Israel are very close, but Lithuania has a very uh, uh, tragic, it's, it's, under, it's a murderous history. Uh, the Lithuanians uh, outshone the, the, the Germans and their hatred of Jews and their massacre of Jews. The Holocaust in Lithuania began even before the Germans arrived. And entire villages uh, were taken out and shot. The chances of surviving the war as a Lithuanian Jew were, were very, very small indeed. Uh, fortunately, my family, uh, they came from a small town about 70 miles from Vilnius, what we call Vilna, uh, got out earlier, of course, in, in the, at the turn of the century. Um, but I mentioned to the foreign minister that, I, that my family did come from this village. And he said, of course, we have to take you. We're going to put you in a car. We're going to bring you out there in a, in a limousine, whatever. We're going to bring you out to, to this uh, town called Anishkaya. Anishkaya is called in Lithuanian and Russian, but in Yiddish, it's called Anisht. And in Anisht, I visited the Jewish section. It's called Synagogue Street. The synagogue's there. It's, it's now a bakery. I saw uh, old Jewish houses that had basements. And my grandmother used to tell me about hiding these basements from the pogroms and hearing the, the hoofs of the Cossacks' horses riding through town. Uh, I visited the grave sites, um, the mass grave sites, where the Jews of Anisht were taken out and shot. They're all shot in one day. Nobody survived. Um, and shtetls in the area. And I came away from the experience deeply moved. I, I didn't even know how to articulate it. I knew there was a story in there somewhere, but I didn't know where to start. And I sat down at a, at a paper and I began to write. And I, I, I began with an 11-year-old girl who likes to run away from the village of Anisht and, and play and hide in a birch forest. And that story then becomes the kernel of a saga that extends through several generations of this family. And uh, I gave it the name of my, my mother's maternal family, the Green family. And um, it's a story about the Holocaust. It's a story about spirituality. It's a story about uh, Israel. It's a story about Israeli politics because one of the survivors actually becomes the mother of an Israeli politician, and, uh, and ultimately it's about redemption. So a very, very difficult story for me. It, it drained me. Yeah, I, I can only imagine, and you know, a little sometimes difficult to read. Um, I have a question from um, our audience, from Ross. What experiences from your Hollywood time influence some of the stories? Well, one story in particular, it's called a Personal Assistant, because uh, I was a personal assistant uh, for Orson Welles, so I know what that's like. Um, and it's about uh, a woman who was a personal assistant to a, an aging, over-the-hill, decrepit actor um, uh, who loves him. And that love in a very strange and ultimately very sad way is reciprocated. Um, and that's what's about. It brings you into the, the real Hollywood. And... Uh, uh, my Hollywood experience was was it was an eye opener for me. Um, I did not stay in Hollywood, and to this day, I do not regret it. That was my my second question. Of you know, you know, two paths, you know, diverge, and you were very happy on the path that you took. Nothing that you look back to in to Hollywood for. No, not at all. And I, you know, over the years, I've had uh, I've had scripts that have been uh, optioned. Uh, this book may be optioned. We'll see. Um, and so it just, it's, it, it is not, I, I chose a different path, not an easy path, a path that led me through wars and terrorism and all sorts of upheaval. Um, the, the assassination of my boss, Yitzhak Rabin, I was an advisor to Rabin, uh, many, many difficulties, um, now with Corona, additional difficulties. Um, but, uh, no, zero regrets. Uh, moving here was the single best decision I ever made. Um... Any of the stories um, related to Rabin or um, we're coming up on the yard site of his death. Um, yep. 
anything you can tell us about that? There's nothing in the story about it. I mean, there's, there's lots of trauma. There's certainly you know, death and murder in these stories, as there is in literary works. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't written about Yitzhak Rabin. Yitzhak Rabin was a, a very unusual and very, very strange individual, very, intensely shy. You'd be surprised um, how shy he was. Um, but um, he had, he had this, this profound impact on my life because when I was 15 years old, I went to, to Washington with my Zionist youth movement and we met with Israel's ambassador to the United States and I got to shake his hand. And uh, at that point I said to myself, that's what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I, I really designed my, my academic life, my political life in order to become an Israel's ambassador to the United States. And, and the ambassador was Yitzhak Rabin. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a, his, his life, his story has been very much entwined with mine and it's, it has, that, it has had that big impact. Yeah. Um, um, from Bill Rosen, who are your favorite short story writers that you have read throughout your life? Um, I, I, two of my current current favorites are Elizabeth Straub, who uh, you may know her from the Olive Kitteridge stories. Now she has a new book called Olive Again. Not the best title, but um, nobody writes about love and loss as she does. Um, Tim O'Brien, uh, his Vietnam stories are are classics, just classics. You know, I spent many years in the military. I spent, I've been through more than one war, and yet all of my military and, um, and war experience are crammed into one short story that is just over a page long. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's called Beautiful Bivouac. It's about a group of soldiers. They're not identified as Israeli soldiers, but they're Israeli. And they're sitting on a, a side of a hill and a night after a battle uh, during a war next day they're going to go back into battle and it's about one soldier in this group and um it's the soldier who's going through all sorts of turmoil in his personal life and it, it, you think that war is sort of a you know you take a break from personal issues and you don't and many fact the personal issues are, are magnified by war and that's what it's about and uh, and yes there's 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 fear in it and yet there's death in it and very violent death um but it's really about the inner life uh, of soldiers and uh, the story opens with a scene that I actually lived through. Um, I was sitting in a battle uh, around a, a, a campfire made up of ammunition crates and, and people are smoking and they're exhausted and, and they're shell shocked. And um, a very large phosphorus shell went off on the opposite hill. And I don't expect many of you have seen phosphorus shells go off, but they go off with this huge plume, this beautiful plume of, of silver. And one of the soldiers remarked said, was the effect that is so beautiful another soldier said no it's, it's not beautiful it's ugly it's hideous and then a conversation ensued around the campfire whether not just whether phosphorus shells were beautiful or ugly but whether war itself uh was ugly or could be beautiful under what connection was it was it beautiful and and then we we switched to the inner world of the soldier who is weighing the question what is beautiful and what is ugly uh, in war what is beautiful, I don't want to give it away, is the relationship between human beings. Um, you told us about your favorite short story writers. Um, I'm going to ask you for your favorite um, Israeli authors. I enjoy reading Israeli fiction. Um, so, but you, you can do fiction or nonfiction. I mean, well, I, I read in English. <laughs> okay. You know, A.B. Oshu is a buddy of mine. I, I think he's amazing. Uh, David Grossman, the usual, um, Mersha Lev. Um, thinking back now, um, historians, I don't know if you, if any would know them. Um, great Israeli historians, they, they go far back. I don't think you don't know their names, but uh, uh, Yolf Gelber is a great, great historian um, of the uh, of Israeli wars, uh, who I very much admire. Um, uh, Israel is rich in literature. Again, we're coming out of this, this Jewish literary tradition. How could we not be rich in literature? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I err on the side of women writers, um, Michal Lemberger and um, uh, who, the woman who wrote The Liar, I yell at Gunder Goshen, that's what it is. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I have another question for, for you from Meta, how many rewrites do you usually go through with any one story? Do you have trusted readers, friends, and or yeah. fellow writers? Do I do, I do. Um, I do not do much rewriting. I mean, I, the story, when I put it down, is already in my head. And um, 
different than many writers. Many writers will do uh, stream of consciousness writing and uh, the story will emerge. No, not like that. It, it's pretty formed. And then it's a matter of paring it down. Um, I happen to live with the greatest critic and some of the toughest critics in the world I've ever met. Um, and some stories that didn't make it to this collection was because she, she told they're not going in the collection. Um, it, it's always difficult. I, I'm always, you know, I'm shaking when I give these, the, the story to her every time. Uh, but she's good and I, 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 ugh, I so appreciate her honesty. And she has greatly improved my writing. She's gotten to be, she has a Hollywood background actually, and uh, Leslie, and uh, it's dedicated to her. And you'll see that um, she got me to be spare very spare to cut down all the time I'm always cutting out never adding I'm always cutting out um I, I think it's a well edited book and um I have seen over the years I believe that publishing houses have cut down on editors because they don't want to pay them so I appreciate that in your book um very much um it is was there one story that you wanted to add or and how did you decide to stop where you stopped uh, I just, I stopped right. I'm already halfway through my next collection and I could have added more, could have taken off, uh, you know, less. I, I don't know. I think this is a good uh, place to stop. Um, and uh, I'd actually given my, my editor another story, story uh, a, a comedy. Um, and uh, I said, okay, let's leave this for the next collection. Um, and again, the ordering was very different. My, my editor wanted a different ordering, by the way. And this is the ordering I decided on. And it wasn't, you know, it's not a, it's not a decision taken lightly. Um, so you mentioned before that you've had some screens taken up in Hollywood. Uh, do you have a relationship with the Israeli film industry? Can we, do you have any films that, um, you know, we can go look for on Netflix or Amazon Prime? Uh, oh God, just Thistle. <laughs> Actually, I had it the other day. Um, um, it's, just, it's just there's some brilliant Israeli uh, series being put out, um, a passionate series. So um, okay. I, I've watched watched the whole thing twice. <laughs> really, uh, it's that good. Um, just some some uh, of course Fauda. I know the creators of Fauda. I know the actors in Fauda. Uh, Fauda is excellent. Really, really just outstanding television and drama, um, and how they convey it in, in, in a a totally alien and complex situation, our relationship with the Palestinians and the Shabak and the, the Palestinian Authority, how they relate, how they get it across to an American audience, not easy. And and, and the American audience may know, not know when characters are speaking Arabic, speaking Hebrew, as in Schlissel, sometimes they speak Yiddish, sometimes they speak Hebrew. Uh, and, and when they do that's significant, uh, but you may not get that. Um, one of my favorite uh, sections of Schlissel is when Schlissel goes to see his estranged daughter and he's estranged from his daughter because his, his daughter has married a Hasid, but the Hasid is from Chabad. And Chabad is considered by many Hasidic groups as, as basically Christian group because it's, it's messianic, because they believe that the, the Rebbe was, was the Messiah. And throughout the entire series, um, the father in Shtetzel uh, refers to the son-in-law as the messianist, Amishichi, right? Which is what another word, for, it's actually a synonym for Christian. So you may, if you're not getting the Hebrew, you're not getting the Yiddish, you're gonna miss that. But it's very, very, I think it's very um, informative. It's a window into that world. Um, I love Shtisel. And because they usually speak Yiddish, their Hebrew um, is simpler and <laughs> I, I can follow it. Um, and um, I, I totally agree with you. Um, we have another comment about, um, you know, different treatments, you know, the beauty of wars, um, and it helps explains the often inexplicable question of why do wars persist and soldiers always enlist? Um, any comment on that? No. That's by, um, Glenn, by J. Glenn Gray. J. Glenn Gray. Um, I don't have an answer for that. I think that uh, there isn't human nature, that combative part. Um, War is fascinating. That's why people write about it all the time. It's uh, the ultimate human con conflict. It um, and I, 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 I make a confession. I've, I've been in a lot of them, and the more I'm in them, sometimes you get the more dr drawn to them. It becomes like an adrenaline thing. Um, and uh, you know, violent conflict has, has gotten, I think, increasingly rare um, in recent decades. 
um, compared certainly to the you know the earlier centuries. Very rare. A war was was a very was a daily was a daily occurrence. Um, but still, but also the the destructive capability of wars has grown bigger. It's one of the reasons why we have fewer wars today. Um, but it's going to remain with us. It's going to be part of the human condition because it was you know in prehistoric times. Yeah, I mean, you know, I believe that there's different, um, you know, you know, what is war and different wars, you know, whether, you know, the war on the coronavirus, whatever ha is happening, are um, inside, you know, terrorist wars, and of course, um, things that you can only experience in Israel. Uh, you know, I think that sometimes we forget that the population of Israel is so small that you know. Now you've been a soldier, so of course you know people who died, but that that circle of death, which we don't have in the United States anymore, um, you know, it's much bigger. It's not, you know, our children are not in a high percentage going going to the army. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, you know, your feelings on that? It's um, war is an experience that if you haven't been in, it's very difficult to convey. And um, and so you can only give glimmers of it. So as I said, my father had been in World War II. He landed on Normandy. Um, I grew up with his war stories, but you, um, I could not know what war was until I'd actually been in it. And um, and it's different than what you think. All I can say is it's just different. Yeah, I I can only shake my head in agreement with you. Um, we're coming up towards the end of the hour. I'm going to ask. Um, my participants, if you have any, have any questions, please, you know, chat me, I can ask them. And um, Ambassador Oren, first of all, we'd love to welcome you back um, after your net, when your next uh, short story come back. I have a short story um, book group, yeah. they said, come on, pick this book, we'll do it next time. I said, yeah. absolutely. Um, so what words would you like to leave us with? Well, first of all, uh, if those of you who want to know the stories behind the stories, you can go to Apple and I have a podcast. I have a, the, the, the mind behind the stories and I talk about the experiences behind the stories, where they come from, where the inspiration comes from. Um, and I, I welcome you. I had a lot of fun doing this podcast. I don't read any of the stories. I just tell you about the story. So please do that. Um, stand up. The message I live with you is, live with you is, is stand up for freedom. Um, there is uh, many challenges to, to, to freedom today and, and different stripes. Uh, certainly for artistic freedom um, and stand behind those of us who are um, celebrating freedom uh, in writing and in other artistic forms. Um, a, lesson, a lesson from Israel is that you can, you can be uh, involved politically in this country, it could be at the right and the left, but you can also be creative, you can be artistic, they're not uh, contradictions. Um, and, uh, and enjoy, enjoy these stories. Um, if you're locked down, if you're if you're at home, if you got the ADHD thing like I do, uh, these are the stories for you because they're all so so different. Um, and I different, easy to read. Uh, so I mean, sometimes the subject matter, but I know um, everyone will enjoy them. I have one last question here. What is Please. the? Oh, I have two. Um, are you contemplating writing any nonfiction history in the near future? And. So the answer, the answer is, is yes, I, I have a long-standing contract with Random House uh, for a book about Israel's War of Independence. And um, I was planning to write it, begin writing about it when I came out of government. Um, you should know that my history books take four years. They are very, very intensive. Um, and they are also very expensive. Um, it's, it's research abroad. It's, it's, it's paying researchers. It's editing. It's maps. It's, it's the, you have to pay for all the pictures in the book. You have to pay for the cover. And the publisher doesn't pay for that. So I had to go out and actually raise money for this because um, there are no more institutes in Israel that support historical research. And, and I'm in the process still of raising that money. Um, it's not, you know, it's not super expensive, but raising money for a book today is difficult. Um, people prefer Jewish philanthropists uh, tend to give for projects that are new media and have immediate, you know, sort of uh, gratification and result. Uh, this is investing in a book that will take four years to write and, um, and it's going to have to get out there. Um, I think I have a very good track record in, the, in my last three books with these bestsellers, uh, but still it's a, it's a process. Can you give us uh, a hint on the topic? Can you give us a hint on the topic? I mean, yeah. the book is called, 
I had originally started, by, I was going to write a, a comprehensive history about Israel's liberation, the Israel war of liberation. And that, when I began thinking about it, it got to be three volumes. It's just, it's just, it's too complicated. It's like writing one volume about World War II or one volume about the Civil War. Too complicated. And I, I actually took it to the other extreme. Um, the book is called Creation, May 14th, 1948, the day of Israel's establishment, the day of Israel's uh, uh, independence. And it's about 24 hours. It's about what happened during the 24 hours um, in what would become Israel. It wasn't Israel yet. And to me, it's one of the most extraordinary dramas um, in modern history, perhaps in all history. Because you have to remember, there were only 600,000 Jews here. It's about the population of Boston. And many of them were survivors of the Holocaust. Um, there were no planes, no tanks, uh, no cannons, surrounded by Arab armies that were poised to throw us uh, into the sea. Um, I had a close relationship with Shimon Peres. He used to say that we had, he used to tell me that we had bullets for, for one week, one week. Um, there wasn't even a majority, a clear majority in the Zionist leadership to declare the state. No one knew the name of the state. Nobody knew the Declaration of Independence, what was going to be in the Declaration of Independence. Nobody knew anything. Jerusalem was under siege. There was fighting down the street in Jaffa here, terrible fighting going on. And so it's about that 24 hours and about the decision um, made by Ben-Gurion and others that changed history, not only Israeli history. Think about what the creation of Israel, its impact on history. And we tend to view history retroactively as inevitable. There was nothing inevitable about this, believe me. So um, it's gonna be a book about four or 500 pages and using a lot of oral histories that have now been recorded videos. Uh, plus archival evidence, plus uh, sources in various languages. I always use um, Arabic sources, Hebrew sources, uh, French, English, Russian sources. And um, it, you know, it would be, again, it would, I would hope to make it the classic book, the you know, book on the shelf about Israel's liberation. There has not been a book written about uh, uh, Israel's war of independence in a long, long time. And um, certainly one or not of this one nature, but again, got to raise the money for it, I tell you. Yeah, I mean, there's still primary sources, people who are still alive. Um, obviously, you know, a, a lot of people have died, but it sounds very interesting and- Wonderful, wonderful project called Toldot Yisrael that has gone out and made about 1400 hours of interviews with uh, veterans of the war. Okay, mm -hmm. well, it's been absolutely fascinating speaking with you. Um, we're so honored you came to Macomb-Sala Lakeside. Uh, we hope you'll come back again. Um, thank you to Leslie, because that's the person that I spoke to. Why didn't yes. speak? But we, we emailed quite a bit. And, um, you know, be well, stay safe. And um, to everybody uh, at Macomb Solo Lakeside, I'm sure that I will uh, see you soon. And um, any questions, you know, let me know. Here's your gallery view. And um, be well. Everybody have a good week. Take care, everyone. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hello from Texas. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Fascinating. Bye.